Now that we've looked at the lovely precipitation reactions and exciting acid-base reactions, we'll explore the mysterious oxidation reduction reactions. These reactions involve a transfer of electrons from one element to another. We'll learn how to identify which element loses the electron and which element gains the electron by calculating oxidation numbers. Lastly, we'll see that ranking various metals by their reactivity gives us something called the activity series. For an example redox reaction, consider the simple reaction between sodium and chlorine to make sodium chloride. Sodium metal is so soft you can cut it with a butter knife. It's also violently reactive. If you were to eat a piece of sodium, you would either die from an extremely basic solution, chewing its way through your esophagus, or else you die because the hydrogen would explode you from within. Chlorine is a yellow gas, and chlorine is extremely toxic. This image shows chlorine gas being employed as a chemical weapon in Syria, which is a war crime. The product of the reaction between explosive sodium metal and toxic chlorine gas is sodium chloride, also known as table salt. Sodium chloride is delicious and humans need it to survive. How can two hazardous substances react to form something so inert? The answer is in the electrons. Notice where these elements live on the periodic table and how far away they are from the noble gases. Remember, the noble gases have a noble number of electrons, which gives them extra stability. Sodium is on the far left of the table. It is only one electron away from having a noble number of electrons. It would do anything to get rid of one electron and live in nobility. Chlorine is on the far right of the periodic table. It is also only one electron away from having a noble number of electrons. Chlorine very, very badly wants just one more electron, please, please, pretty please, so it can become noble. After the reaction, the sodium metal is turned into sodium ion, and the chlorine gas is turned into chloride ion. These ions have a noble number of electrons, and just like noble gases, they do not want to react any further. When an element loses an electron, we say that element is oxidized. When an element gains an electron, we say that element is reduced, which gives us the name redox for reactions in which electrons are transferred. The other two reaction flavors from chapter four, precipitation and acid base, do not involve an electron transfer. Redox reactions always involve a pair of reactants. If something gains electrons, something else must lose electrons. In other words, if something is oxidized, something else must be reduced. I have two stupid mnemonics to help you remember who gains and who loses electrons. You can either think about a lion named Leo who says, grr. Leo means lose electron oxidation. Gur means gain electron reduction. Otherwise, you could remember oil rig. Oxidation is losing, reduction is gaining. Now, it's not always easy to see who gains and who loses the electrons. So chemists developed a mathematical way to figure it out. We assign something called oxidation numbers to elements in a reaction. If an element's oxidation number changes, that means a redox reaction has occurred. Oxidation numbers represent the local charge around that atom. So for simple redox reactions between sodium and chloride, for instance, the oxidation numbers are just the charge on the species. While there are only two rules for assigning oxidation numbers, it often takes some practice to get comfortable doing so. The first rule is that the sum of all oxidation numbers in a compound will equal the charge of that compound. This makes it easy to assign oxidation numbers to neutral elements like sodium, metal, and oxygen gas. The oxidation number for all neutral elements is zero. Likewise, it's easy to know the oxidation number of a simple ion because the oxidation number will merely be the charge of that ion. Na plus has an oxidation number of plus one. 
Cl minus has an oxidation number of minus one. Mg2 plus has an oxidation number of plus two. For larger compounds and polyatomic ions, we need another rule to determine the oxidation number of each atom. The second rule is that oxygen has an oxidation number of minus two unless it's a peroxide compound, in which case the oxidation number is minus one. This may not seem like enough rules, but I promise you, it is. Okay, here's a practice problem. Use the two rules from before to assign oxidation numbers to all atoms in the compound sodium carbonate. I put my suggested steps to the right. Okay, here's how I would solve it. First, I would break sodium carbonate into its ions, sodium and carbonate. Sodium ion has a plus one charge, so it has a plus one oxidation state. Carbonate is a polyatomic ion, so I can't easily assign oxidation numbers to the atoms using rule number one. But I do know that the sum of the oxidation numbers of the atoms in carbonate will equal minus two, which is the charge on carbonate. One carbon plus three oxygen will equal minus two. And I know from rule two that oxygen has an oxidation number of minus two, which I'll put into my equation. Now I just need to solve for the oxidation on carbon, which gives me plus four. If I want to check my answer, I can add up all the oxidation numbers in the compound and it should equal the total charge on the compound. Sodium carbonate is a neutral compound and the sum of all the oxidation numbers equals zero. Well done, Brandon. At this point, I'd like to take a step back and ask, why does oxidation number matter? Not just what it is, it's the local electrons around an atom, but how does this affect my understanding of the universe? And if you've been paying attention, you know that I like to anthropomorphize the elements. This isn't just to make teaching about them more fun. It's truly and really how I think about chemistry. As a human, I, I find it easier to relate to elements when they have human characteristics. So in my view of the universe, families on the periodic table have similar chemical properties because families have similar personalities. At the beginning of the lecture, we talked about sodium, an alkali metal. The alkali metals are really explosive, but afterward, they get super chill. Carbon's family loves to make friends, even with itself. Oxygen's family is really clingy, and they tend to hog things when they do end up sharing. And of course, the noble gases are the laziest family in the whole universe. If an element's family gives it a personality, then its oxidation number determines its mood. For group 1A, if the oxidation number is zero, they have a lot of pent up energy just waiting to get out. But after they explode, their oxidation number becomes plus one and they're super calm and unreactive. For group 6A, with an oxidation number of zero, they're feeling really lonely and they're looking to make friends if they can summon up the energy. At oxidation number minus one, they're feeling stuck with someone unlikable and they wanna meet somebody new. At oxidation number minus two, they're super happy, but it's because they get to hog all your stuff. So to return to our original philosophizing, the oxidation numbers on elements determine how they will interact with each other in any given situation. And that's a very important thing for a chemist to know. Okay, back to the real world. You've probably seen acids eating through metals in movies. Well, this is partially based on real life. Acids will steal an electron from metals to dissolve the metal. Try writing the net ionic equation for the reaction described here. Assign oxidation numbers and identify who is oxidized and who is reduced. Pause the video now and try it out. Okay, 
Here's the solution. First, I write the balanced molecular equation. It takes two hydrobromic acid molecules to react with one zinc atom. Next, I split apart the aqueous ions on both sides. I noticed that I can cancel two bromide ions from each side to write the net ionic equation. The net ionic zeroes in on what actually happens. Here, H plus stole some electrons from zinc metal, which turned the H plus into hydrogen gas and zinc metal into zinc ion. Quite the mood swing. Assigning oxidation numbers to these ions is quite easy since it's just their charge. I see that hydrogen went from plus one to zero, meaning it gained an electron, reduction. And zinc went from zero to plus two, meaning it lost electrons, oxidation. Each of the metals has its own personality, I mean reactivity. Some metals hold onto their electrons very tightly. These elements are quite unreactive. Other metals, like sodium, are dying to give an electron away. If we rank the metals according to how tightly they hold their electrons, in other words, how easily they are oxidized, we have created something called the activity series of the metals. You'll be given the activity series on exams, but you need to know what it translates to. I'd like to point out some trends. The group 1A metals are all at the top of the list because they're easy to give their electrons away. They're very reactive. The group 2A metals are also near the top of the list and are also quite reactive. Transition metals like zinc, iron, and nickel are right in the middle of the periodic table. These metals have a wide variety of uses, both in industry and in biology, due to their medium reactivities. At the bottom of the list, we have the coinage metals, which are extremely unreactive. This is why humans have used these metals for money and for conductive wiring. We don't want them reacting away. The least reactive metal of all is gold, and it's at the very bottom of the list. Gold is so reactive that you can submerge gold in concentrated acid and it will just chill. However, gold isn't totally unreactive. Time for a fun story. In 1940, the nasty Nazis were steamrolling through Denmark, stealing anything that could be of use to their brutal war machine. Before fleeing Copenhagen, a chemist named George de Hevesy took the Nobel Prizes of Max von Lau and James Franck and dissolved them in a strong oxidant called aqua regia. He left the gold solution on the shelf in his lab and the dumb Nazis had no idea what was inside. After the war, he returned and reduced the gold ion back into gold metal, then sent it to the Nobel Committee to have them recast the prizes from the original gold atoms. Way to go, George. Thank you for pulling one over on the Nazis.